Good morning and welcome to Around Kansas. I'm Michelle Martin, your co-host. And as you can see, I am flying solo today. I have a new saying, when Deb's away, Michelle gets to play. So I hope you'll enjoy today's show. Today in our Discovering History series, I want to introduce you to or remind you about two significant conflicts in the American Civil War that took place west of the Mississippi with Kansas connections. But to begin to understand those two important conflicts, the Battle of Island Mound and the Battle at Honey Springs, we need to talk a little bit about one of Deb's and my favorite individuals in Kansas history, Senator James Henry Lane. Now, some of you may know Lane for his bombastic speaking style. And if you've been to Lecompton to uh, Constitution Hall State Historic Site, and you have seen Site Administrator Tim Ruiz portray James Henry Lane, which he does a fantastic job, folks, he really captures that kind of flamboyant style of James Henry Lane. Uh, some people may remember Lane for his crazy and wild hair in his photographs. Someone definitely needed to get him a little personal styling before he sat and had his pictures made. But no matter how you remember Lane, one of James Henry Lane's most important contributions during the Civil War was the push to admit or to bring in African American and American Indian soldiers to the Union Army. And of course he does this as he helps travel throughout Kansas, raising regiments of African-American soldiers uh, and also American Indians to serve in regiments. So the first and second Kansas colored infantry units are really intimately connected to Lane and all of his uh, activity in Kansas, going ahead and bringing in troopers. But also, the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Regiments of Indian Home Guard are also important. Many of the members of the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Regiments of Indian Home Guard were individuals who had followed the Muscogee Creek leader Abathu Yahola in 1860 and 1861 as he led close to 10,000 men, women, and children on a flight from the Indian Territory to the safety of Union-controlled Kansas. And many of those men who made that trek with Confederate troopers nipping at their heels all along the way, made the decision once they arrived in Kansas to serve for the Union. So with James Henry Lane actively recruiting African-Americans with American Indians coming into the Union forces, uh, we now have a situation, what to do with these troopers, when to send them into battle. And if you've seen the movie, Glory, that tells you the complicated story of the 54th Massachusetts, they would lead you to believe that their African-American soldiers were the first to see combat in the Civil War. But this simply isn't true, folks, because the Battle of Island Mound fought near Butler, Missouri on October 28th and 29th of 1862 is the first time African-American Union troops see combat against a Confederate or Confederate guerrilla enemy forces. And that's exactly what happens at the Battle of Island Mound. Uh, the first uh, Kansas colored infantry is led by Captain uh, Matthews, who is noted for his gallantry, his bravery, and his resolve in the face of overwhelming odds. And at Island Mound, those African-American men dig in around a farmstead and they uh, fortify their position and they rename their position Fort Africa. And there they're able to repel uh, various Confederate guerrilla attacks against them. That goes ahead and helps push back that Confederate guerrilla front along the border between Lynn County in Kansas and Bates County in Missouri. Now, a little later in the war, the summer of 1863, to be exact, we see uh, activity in the Indian Territory. Folks, most people don't realize there were over 100 documented battles or skirmishes 
that took place between pro-Union and pro-Confederate forces in the Indian Territory that we now call Oklahoma, our neighbor to the South. And the Battle of Honey Springs was one of them. It was fought on July 17th, 1863. And it saw Union forces led by Blunt uh, in combat against Confederate forces led by uh, Cooper. And one of the defining features of Blunt's army was that the first Kansas Colored Infantry was there with him in combat, as well as uh, elements of the first, second, and third regiments of Indian Home Guard. The irony about the Battle of Honey Springs, which folks is actually the largest battle that takes place in Indian territory. We have over 9,000 men on the field of battle that day. Um, the irony is that the Confederates had been courting support from many of the men who were members of what we call the five civilized tribes. Those would be the Muscogee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Cherokee, and the Seminole. And those uh, native nations were split. Uh, some joining the, the Confederacy, others supporting the Union. So in many cases, on the field of battle that day, within uh, the ranks of the American Indian troopers, we had sometimes brother against brother, father against son, cousin against cousin, clan members against clan members fighting on the field of battle. But for Union forces, the day was a victory and helped repulse and push back Confederate advances in the Indian Territory. Now, the great thing about both the Battle of Island Mound and the Battle of Honey Springs is that there are areas of their battlefields that are preserved. They have amazing interpretive exhibits and displays, and you can visit them both and walk in the steps of this important aspect of military history west of the Mississippi. And it's all connected to Kansas. So we will provide you with links for the battles and the historic sites uh, on our Facebook page and on YouTube. We'll be right back with our wildlife segment next. Welcome to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery and adventure, no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP. That brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun. Howdy, I'm Seth Hayes and welcome to my hometown from then to now. Council Grove has a rich history as deep as the prairie tall grass. Spend the day visiting 25 historic sites or explore the unique shops and restaurants. Mosey out of town along the Santa Fe Trail. You all visit my hometown, Council Grove in the heart of the Flint Hills. Welcome back to Around Kansas. I'm Michelle Martin, your co-host. Deb is actually in historic Council Grove right now doing very important Santa Fe Trail business. She'll be back with us next week. And as I said, when Deb's away, Michelle gets to play. And today we're going to take a trip back in the Around Kansas Wildlife Vault for Wildlife Wednesday. And behind me, you see, well, a bird that most people find very frightening, but I actually have grown to love. It is the raven. When I was growing up in Michigan, my mother loved feeding birds and my dad too. And we always had bird feeders. And I, at my parents' home on our deck, we have huge sets of bird feeders. And every day, my mother would say hello and good morning to Edgar and Annabelle our pair of ravens 
that spent a great deal of time eating on our deck. So today, in memory of my mom and her love for ravens and the fact I think they are absolutely incredible, let's look at ravens. My favorite birds, and I've said this before on Around Kansas, are crows and ravens. That may be uh, because of Edgar Allan Poe, you know, quoth the raven nevermore. There's an air of intelligence and mystery. And I can remember walking around the cemetery, you know, Topeka Cemetery, and there would be a huge crow on top of a, on top of a tombstone. And I'm like, wow, what a picture. And, you know, what does the crow know that, that I don't know? A lot, probably. So I found another one of these interesting birds that I had no idea lives in Kansas, and that is the Chihuahuan Raven. And while it is mostly in western Kansas, it might show up just anywhere. So we turn to uh, Cornell, um, their uh, bird library, which is just phenomenal, Cornell University, and also Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism for information on this very interesting bird. The Chihuahuan Raven is the largest member of the crow family still found in Kansas. In the summertime, it is usually found in the far western part of the state. They do not require trees, but their stick nest may be found in isolated trees and on windmills on the prairie. Their breeding range formerly encompassed the western part of Kansas along the Colorado border, eastward as far as Ford, Kearney, Finney, and Gray counties. They have been seen at garbage dumps in Seward County. It's probably an opportunist and will eat carrion or vegetable matter as it is available. The Chihuahuan raven has been recorded as occurring every month of the year. The species appears to be an uncommon summer resident in the extreme southwestern part of the state and rare elsewhere in the state. It is a rare winter resident in the west and may occasionally wander eastward in the winter. This species needs arid areas, particularly desert and scrubby grasslands, but are thinly distributed. If you're looking for them, be sure to scan utility poles, ranch operations, windmills, any kind of high perch. Unlike most crows and ravens, the Chihuahuan raven frequently reuses its nest in subsequent years. Some pairs may maintain two nests and use them in alternate years. The oldest recorded Chihuahuan raven was at least 21 years, nine months old, when it was caught and released in Arizona in 2001. It had been banded in the same state in 1980. The bases of the neck and body feathers of a Chihuahuan raven are white, not gray like those of other American crows and ravens. The white is difficult to see in the field and is only revealed by wind blowing the feathers or when a bird fluffs its feathers to display at another raven. Although this coloration is unique in North America, a number of other crows and ravens around the world have white bases to their feathers as well. They are sometimes mistakenly harvested for crow. Thanks to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and its All About Birds website and Kansas Department of Wildlife for facts on this amazing raven. Okay, looks like it's time for our tour. Welcome to the Fort Wallace Museum. Here at the museum, you're going to find some really interesting stuff like our replica stagecoach from the Butterfield Overland Dispatch. We've got facades from the fort buildings. And we've got an 1870s flag. There's a plesiosaur that was discovered locally. We've got the Ray Pump Organ Collection. We're a little bit of place with a great big story and we'd love to have you. In 1821, a trade route was opened from Missouri in the United States across prairies and mountains to Mexico. In 2021, we will mark 200 years of epic conflicts and grand adventures, larger than life personalities and sweeping landscapes. Join us on an historic journey. The Santa Fe Trail lives on. Find us on social media or santafetrail.org. Welcome 
Welcome back to Around Kansas. I'm Michelle Martin, your co-host. And today on our fun segment, we are going to talk about all of the fun things that you can see and do in Bartlesville and Dewey, Oklahoma. Now, I know you're thinking, Oklahoma, we're <laughs> around Kansas, but Bartlesville and Dewey both have lots of Kansas connections. And I've enlisted the help of my good friend, historian, Kay Little from Little History Adventures to help us. Welcome, Kay. Thank you, Michelle. I am so happy to be here. I've had so much fun learning more about Kansas and the correlations with our history. So thank you. Well, in all the years I lived in Bartlesville, I certainly took you on enough Kansas history field trips. So, so I yep. know that you know all of these connections. So, <laughs> so Kay, let's start by telling our viewers what are the connections between the history of Kansas in Bartlesville and Dewey in Northeast Oklahoma? Well, the main ones are we have Jake Bartles, who Bartlesville is named for. Jake Bartles, Nelson Carr, and Arthur Armstrong are some of our founding fathers. And they all three served with the Sixth Kansas during the Civil War. And they all three moved here to help start this community. Um, so, and that's just, three of the people, we have um, we have some correlations with Little House on the Prairie too, with Doc Tan, um, mm -hmm. who is in the book, also was a doctor here in town. And uh, the Osage and the Delaware, both those tribes came here from Kansas. Of course, they had been in other places before Kansas, but they they moved when they moved here, they came directly from Kansas. So those are some of our interesting connections. So one of the great things about being in Bartlesville and in Dewey, and I lived there for nine years, so it was fantastic, is there are actually places that folks can go visit to kind of see these historical connections and kind of walk in history's footsteps. So if our folks wanted to go ahead and come to Bartlesville, and connect to that history? Where should they go? Well, um, one place would be to go to what is called Johnstone Park in uh, the north part of Bartlesville. And you can see at, um, and see it's on the east side, a small pavilion, and they have a marker there that tells about the mill that Nelson Carr built and then Jake Bartles um, later bought it and they ran a mill there right along the river. Now the mill's no longer there, but if you go when um, the water is somewhat low, you can still see the foundation stones and there's mm -hmm. a, a historical marker that tells the story about it. So that's one place you could go. Um, you can't really see exactly where Doc Tan was, but he was, he had a hospital east of town behind what is now the um, baseball fields. And there's also a mm -hmm. cemetery back there named Beck, Beck Cemetery. And he had a hospital next to there. And so his patients that didn't make it were usually buried in that cemetery. And so that's another place. Um, you, if you want to know more about the Osage and the Delaware, the Delaware headquarters are here in town. Um, mm -hmm. East in the eastern part of Bartlesville off of Tuxedo. And they have um, housing, they have a gym, they have a walking trail, and they also have a museum now. So there's all kinds of places that you can visit. They have a daycare center. So they have quite a bit to offer. Now the Osage did come here, but they didn't stay here because they found out they weren't supposed to be here. They were supposed to be a few miles west. They ended up going to Pahuska which is a few miles down the road. I know that's not Bartlesville Dewey, right. but a trip here is worth a trip going down to Pahuska yes. and um, Osage Nation Museum, Osage County Museum to learn more about the Osage and then lots of other fun stuff to do there. Well, and let's face it, you can't go to Pahuska without going to the Mercantile uh, to right. see Reed Drummond's uh, Mercantile her boarding house, which is her little hotel, P-Town Pizza, uh, and all the amazing shops that have come up too. So 
And you know, also, um, a little bit about the Bartlesville Area History Museum because gosh what a treasure trove. Exactly I was going to talk about that next. Yes downtown Bartlesville on Johnstone 401 Johnstone in in the fifth floor of City Hall is the Bartlesville Area History Museum and it's actually about the the history of all of Washington County so hence Bartlesville area and you will find all kinds of information and photos about all of these people we're talking about today and events. Um, we had an excellent um, photographer here for several decades who, who loved history. And so they have um, just bukus of pictures and information, but it is an excellent museum. I highly Actually recommend it. The image behind me is actually uh, comes from the Bartlesville Area History Museum's collection. Yes, it and does. Uh, this is uh, you know part of downtown Bartlesville, and obviously you can still see some of uh, the old buildings downtown. Um, now, also, you know, with Nelson Franklin Carr coming in, and he settled and kind of founded what became the nucleus of Bartlesville, and then Jake Bartles came in. And then Jake Bartles ended up going up to Dewey. So what can our, what Kansas connections with Jake Bartles can folks see if they go to Dewey? Yes, he, uh, he was on the north side of the Caney River here in Bartlesville, but he kind of got upset about a few things and decided, mm -hmm. oh, I'm just gonna move my store north in this big field that I have bought, you know? And so he had named it Dewey and was building, having a hotel built. So he moved his store a few miles um, north, and you can follow when you if you follow Highway 123 from downtown um, Bartlesville, you will actually be traveling on the road that he traveled. Of course, it wasn't you know nice road like we have mm -hmm. now, but but anyway, that's the the trail that he took to go to Dewey, and the Dewey Hotel is still there, and you can take tours. And they have done their best to make it look like it did when Jake and Nanny lived there. Um, so that's that's one really big thing. Plus, um, there's a bank building still there that he built. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, too, Dewey is just about, what, 10, 10 miles from Kansas. I mean, we are so close to the Kansas border. Mm -hmm. It is nothing to go to, to go to Caney and then on up to the rest of, of Kansas. But, Yes. Yeah. And I think that what that shows our visitors is in the 19th century, especially the borders were a little flexible. Um, now for people settling like Jake and uh, Nelson, uh, both of them were able to settle in Bartlesville in that area. It was part of the Indian Territory. Yes. And for them to be able to stay permanently legally, they had to be married to um, Native American women, which they were. And yes. then, of course, they put down the roots for these amazing communities. You know, um, I think there are so many other amazing places folks can visit. Um, you know, when I moved to Bartlesville in 2007, uh, the food scene and a lot of those things were just really starting to get rolling. And boy, I'll tell you what, um, you can go to Bartlesville and learn about Jacob Bartles and Nelson Franklin Carr, who, by the way, um, our Kansas viewers, uh, he moved to Kansas from New York and lived with his family in Bourbon County. And I, I was doing some research, I discovered I'm actually related to Nelson Franklin Carr all the way back in Rhode Island. Our families intermarried with one another in Rhode Island in uh, the 1700s. So I'm, you know, distant shirt tail cousin to uh, Nelson Franklin Carr. But you know, when you're walking through Bartlesville and you're learning all of this history, make sure that you visit Frank Lloyd Wright's Price Tower. I mean, yes. how can you not visit Frank Lloyd Wright's only skyscraper? Uh, take in some of the eateries in downtown, uh, Frank and Lola's. If you want a great hamburger and fries or a great burger with homemade chip, potato chips, yes. go visit Frank and Lola's. Um, Outpost Coffee, Hideaway Pizza, the best pizza on the planet. Um, but if you're if you're more adventurous too, head outside of uh, Bartlesville and Dewey, head on out to Woolerock. 
that is the ranch and that became a museum and wildlife refuge for uh, Frank Phillips. And then of course in Bartlesville uh, in the historic Cherokee uh, Avenue neighborhood, you can also visit Frank and Jane Phillips's wonderful mansion that is lovingly restored and preserved. So there's so much. And when you're in Dewey, take in the Tom Mix Museum. If we've got any Western film buffs watching today in Dewey, Oklahoma, you can go to the Tom Mix Museum and see some fantastic um, items that belong to Tom Mix. Yes. Uh, he spent time in Dewey. Uh, you can learn more about Jake Bartles and the Dewey Roundup. Uh, it started as a reunion of his sixth Kansas cavalry buddies and turned into uh, one of the West's biggest and longest running rodeos. Yes. There's so much that you can see and do in Bartlesville and Dewey uh, that have Kansas connections. Yes. So I want to thank my I want to thank my good friend Kay Little for joining us today. And uh, you can check her out on Facebook on Little History Adventures. She does uh, history tours, history education, living history. Uh, and so she's bitten by that history bug like Deb and I. So thank you so much for joining us today, Kay. You are so welcome. I was excited to be able to share because I, I love the connections between Kansas and, and our area. So thank you for allowing me to share some of those. All right. Well, folks, that's all the time we have today. I hope you enjoyed today's show. And again, we thank our special guest, Kay Little. And next week, Deb will be back with me as we take you somewhere around Kansas. <laughs>